the night falls hard over the medieval valley, and the stone farmhouse stands silent in the dark. The wind slips through every crack in the wall. The air is sharp. The cold is real. Minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit and no fireplace. You can almost see their breath hanging in the room as the family gathers close, trying to hold on to every bit of warmth. The stone keeps stealing away. Imagine that for a moment. A house built to protect them, becoming the thing that freezes them. So how do they do it? How did they sleep warm in a place that should have taken their heat in minutes? Tonight, we open that door and we step inside seven quiet techniques, seven small victories, seven ways they survived the cold. The first thing that froze them wasn't the wind, it was the floor. A stone slab so cold it could pull the heat out of a sleeping body in minutes. In a night of minus 40 degrees with no fireplace to push back the dark, that floor became the real enemy. And the only part of the house they could change was the ground beneath their feet. So they looked down and they learned something simple. Earth holds warmth better than stone. And when you feed it with the right materials, it becomes a shield, a quiet shield. They began with what they had, straw from the barn, leaves gathered in autumn, dry grass saved from the last warm month. They pressed it all down into a thick, tight layer. Then they pulled animal hides over the top and framed the edges with wood, turning loose scraps into a firm, warm platform. It didn't look like much, but it changed everything. It raised the ground temperature by 10 to 15 degrees. It slowed the loss of body heat. It let the family sleep through the night. A small victory, but a real one. If you've ever stepped on modern insulated flooring, you've felt the same idea. Different century, same science. Warmth by design, not by fire. And here, the silent heroes were the earth and the straw. Two humble things working all night without complaint. Imagine the father checking the layer before everyone lay down, pressing the edges to keep the wind from slipping through. Imagine the children curling into that pocket of warmth, the only warm place in a house built entirely of cold stone. Minus 40 degrees, no fireplace, but a floor that finally gave something back. Inside a medieval stone farmhouse, the walls were giants, 60 to 80 centimeters thick, cold to the touch. Heavy enough to swallow every echo of warmth the family tried to hold on to. In a night of minus 40 degrees, with no fireplace to radiate even a single line of heat, those walls should have been a curse. But the people who lived here knew something we often forget. A thick wall doesn't just take warmth, it also steadies the air. And inside that stillness, warmth can grow. That is how the wall niche was born. A small hollow carved deep into the stone, 40 to 60 centimeters of shelter tucked inside the cold. They would set a narrow bed frame or a wooden bench right against that enormous wall. The stone, though freezing on the outside, held a slow and quiet core on the inside. The niche blocked the wind. It softened temperature swings. It wrapped the sleeper in a pocket of stable air, a tiny room inside a room. Not warm, but warmer. And in a minus 40 night, that difference meant everything. If you touch a brick wall in winter today, you can feel the same principle. It cools fast on the surface, but holds steady deeper in. Ancient physics, modern house, same story. Warmth by design, not by fire. And here, the silent hero was the wall itself. A giant built from stone, yet gentle enough to cradle a child through the coldest hours. Picture a medieval father checking the niche before bedtime, clearing drafts with his hand, making sure the little space was safe. Picture the child curling into that carved out shelter, breathing slow, wrapped in the calm of a wall that suddenly felt protective instead of cruel. Minus 40 degrees, no fireplace, but a warm corner carved from cold stone. In a stone farmhouse where every wall breathed cold, the wooden frame was the only place they could shape warmth with their own hands. They couldn't heat the air, so they had to trap it, hold it still, keep it close to the body. And from that simple truth came one of the smartest inventions of the medieval winter, the box bed. A sleeping cupboard carved from wood and survival instinct. 
it began as four wooden walls, tight boards, a sliding door, a small space just big enough for a family member to curl into. Inside, they lined the bed with straw for lift and insulation, then layered wool blankets on top. Everything designed to trap one thing, air, not hot air, just air that stayed still long enough to warm. And when someone crawled inside that wooden chamber, something remarkable happened. The temperature rose by 20 to 25 degrees. The wind disappeared. The children slept safely. A quiet victory, but a real one. If you've ever seen a modern sleeping pod or an insulated cabin bed, you've seen the same principle. Different tools, same idea. Warmth by design, not by fire. But the real hero here wasn't the wood. It wasn't the wool. It wasn't even the craftsmanship. It was the air trapped inside, the stillness, the pocket where breath, body, heat, and quiet courage gathered together. Picture a medieval father closing the sliding door at night, checking the edges for drafts, making sure his family had a protected space in a home made of stone and silence. Picture a child curling into that small, warm world, hearing the wind outside, but feeling none of it on their skin. Minus 40 degrees, no fireplace. Yet inside that wooden box, warmth stayed. A small room within a frozen world. And for them, that was enough. In the dead of winter, when a stone farmhouse held more cold than comfort, every warm breath mattered. Families didn't sleep alone back then. They shared the same space with goats, sheep, and small animals, not out of convenience, but out of survival. And the reason was simple. At minus 40 degrees, the body loses heat too fast, especially the small ones. A child could slip into danger before dawn. They needed another source of warmth, something steady, something alive. That's when they noticed it. Each animal, even the small ones, gave off heat. 100 to 200 watts of quiet living warmth. Not a fire, but close enough to matter. So they built their homes around that truth. A thin wooden wall, a small pen pressed right up against the sleeping area. Just a few boards between the family and the animals. The heat leaked through gently warming the room by three to seven degrees. Not much on paper, but in a stone house with no fireplace. It was the difference between trembling and breathing easy between danger and rest. The air grew drier, the night grew softer, and the children slept. Three small changes, one real outcome, warmth. Today, people use small oil heaters or electric radiators to warm a single room. Medieval families used the same logic long before the technology existed. A natural radiant heating system built from instant closeness and the rhythm of winter life. And the silent hero here wasn't the wall or the wood. It was the living warmth of the animals. A gentle heat that traveled through boards, settling into the room like a quiet promise. Picture the father checking the pen before bed, making sure the boards were tight, listening to the soft movements on the other side. Picture a child drifting asleep, knowing the warmth next door was enough to carry them through the night. Minus 40 degrees, no fireplace, but life warming life. When a medieval family faced a night of minus 40 degrees with no fireplace, their first line of defense wasn't a wall or a bed. It was the clothing on their skin, their personal furnace. And in a house where stone stole every bit of warmth, staying dry was everything. Moisture was the silent killer. Sweat turned to ice. Breath clung to fabric. A single damp layer could strip away the heat a child needed to survive until dawn. So they turned to a system that seems simple today, but was brilliant then. Three layers, linen, wool, fur, each one doing a job no other could replace. Linen stayed closest to the skin. It wicked moisture kept the body dry. Then came thick wool, the heart of their warmth, trapping pockets of air like tiny shields. And on the outside fur, not against the skin, never there, but as a final barrier to the wind, soft enough to bend heavy enough to block the cold. And when all three worked together, something changed. They stayed dry. They stayed warm. They stopped losing heat to the air. A quiet victory. A necessary one. 
If you've ever layered up for winter, base layer, mid layer, outer shell, you've used the same idea. Modern science confirming ancient instinct. Warmth by design, not by fire. And the hero of the night here was wool. Strong, breathable, reliable even when damp. The material that turned a freezing stone room into a place where a child could sleep without fear. Picture a medieval mother adjusting her child's wool layer, making sure no cold air slipped in through the collar. Picture the father checking the fur cloak before stepping outside, knowing that one mistake, one drop of moisture could change everything. Minus 40 degrees. No fireplace, but layer by layer. Warmth held on. In a stone farmhouse hammered by winter winds, the cold didn't always come from the air. It came from the way the wind moved, the way it slipped through cracks, the way it swept across the floor like a thin, invisible blade. A single draft could pull the warmth off a sleeping body in minutes, and the families who lived here learned that if they couldn't stop the cold, they could hide from it. Their homes held a secret advantage, curved corners, small recesses in the stone, Natural wind shelters carved by old builders who understood the landscape better than we think. When someone slept in one of those curved pockets, the wind slowed by 60 to 80 percent. The air stopped rushing, the warmth stopped fleeing, and the night became survivable again. So they built around that shape. A wool curtain, a fur panel, a wooden crate or chest leaned just right to form a little sleeping corner. A tiny refuge inside a brutal house. Still air. Warmer breaths. No more waking to the sting of wind. A small victory, but a sweet one. They didn't know the term aerodynamics, but they understood it better than most of us today. They knew how the wind curled, how it broke, how it could be tamed by a simple curve in the wall. If you've ever tucked yourself into the warmest corner during a blackout away from drafts, you've felt the same instinct. Ancient and modern, identical in the dark. And here, the silent hero was the curved stone itself. A shape that turned danger into shelter, a soft shield against the hardest nights. Minus 40 degrees, no fireplace, but a quiet corner, warm enough to make it through. In a stone farmhouse with no fireplace, survival wasn't just about what you wore or where you slept. It was about when you slept. Timing mattered because the body loses one to two degrees of heat when you stay awake too long, especially in a house that steals warmth faster than you can make it. And in a night of minus 40 degrees, that small drop could mean hours of shivering or worse. So medieval families learned to move with the cold, to lie down before the freeze reached its peak. Around the ninth hour of the night, when the last bit of daytime warmth still clung to their clothes and to the air inside the box bed. They called it nothing, but they practiced it like a rule. Go to sleep early, hold the warmth close, let the group's heat stack together. A simple choice, a powerful effect. Because when a family settled into their wooden sleeping boxes before the deep cold arrived, their shared heat created a steady pocket of warmth. The temperature didn't crash. Their bodies burned fewer calories. Their breath filled the space, gently warming it instead of freezing on the air. They didn't talk about circadian rhythms, but they lived by them. Their natural clock was a tool, a shield, a quiet survival instinct. And today, during a blackout or a winter outage, the same truth holds. Go to bed early. Stay in sync with the cold. Protect the heat your body already made. In a world without fire, warmth wasn't just something they built. It was something they timed. Minus 40 degrees, no fireplace, but a bedtime. That kept them alive. And then the night begins to fade. The minus 40 cold loosens its grip as the first thin line of light slips through the cracks between the stones. Breath becomes softer, the room feels gentler, and for a moment you understand how they made it through. Not with fire, not with abundance, but with design. Microclimates built from earth and wood, straw, wool. Still air held in place by quiet wisdom, 
Seven strategies that asked for no flame, yet kept a family alive. Our ancestors depended on knowledge. We depend on a thermostat. Two worlds, same cold, but only one remembers how warmth is earned. Maybe that's the lesson. Sometimes what keeps us warm isn't fire at all, but the way we guard every bit of heat we already have. If your power went out on a winter night, which of these seven would you try first? And next time, we'll explore the question no one asks, how did they cook through winter without a fireplace?